In the home kitchen, I think that measuring ingredients by volume is good. I think measuring ingredients by weight is also good. I could easily make that argument, but everybody makes that argument these days, don't they? The celebrity chef phenomenon has taken tons of methods and values from the professional kitchen, and it's foisted them upon the home kitchen, where I think many of those methods have limited applicability. The pros like to measure by weight, I like to measure by volume, and I have five reasons for that, or possibly six. We'll get to that. But first, we need to establish that this is not a metric versus imperial debate. All widely used measurement systems in the whole world have units of volume and units of weight. You totally can measure out 100 milliliters of flour, even though nobody does that. Most people watching this in the metric world right now would probably call this about 50 grams of flour. Likewise, the United States system of customary measurements that evolved here from the British imperial system has both weight and volume measurements. We got them both! I would call this half a cup of flour, but you could call it about two ounces of flour. The ounce is a unit of weight, not to be confused with the fluid ounce, which is a unit of volume. That is legit confusing. A cup is eight fluid ounces. A fluid ounce is the volume that would be occupied by one ounce of water by weight, roughly that volume, or an ounce of wine in merry old England, just a fun historical fact there. But anyways, yes, it's absolutely true that people here in the United States are more likely to measure stuff by volume than say our peers over in Europe, who pretty much all have kitchen scales but that fact is not inherent to our respective systems of measurement. You can do weight or volume in either system. So why is volume still kind of popular here in the States? As far as I can tell, nobody knows, but here's a hypothesis from Dr. Stephen Mim, a historian at the University of Georgia who is working on a book about the history of measurement systems in the U.S. In the early 20th century, the, the federal government created something called the Bureau of Standards. It fanned out across the country and it did a bunch of tests on shopkeepers and restaurants and places where people were using measures and, the, you know, how much does this pint really measure? And they actually knew how much a pint was supposed to be and they found that every single measure, almost without exception, was off. Oftentimes to the detriment of people buying things at the deli counter or at, or at a grocery. Twas ever thus, right? There is ample record of merchants in ancient Rome cheating their customers out of a libra of barley or whatever. Curse you, Aphidius Fortis, I want my silver quinari back. Measuring by weight is harder to scam as long as you have a, an authority or a regulator who calibrates the scales. And measuring by cup or you know other volumetric measures can be fiddled with in a variety of very interesting and creative ways that retailers have, have honed over millennia. Um, and so in the United States, the government has been, I would say, a little less willing to step into that kind of granular regulation, whereas in Europe, it's, there's a more of a tradition of that. That cultural and constitutional resistance to top-down government regulation here in the U.S. might also explain at least somewhat why we are the only major economy in the whole world that has yet to fully adopt the metric system. For more about that history, see my earlier video with Dr. Mim that is linked in the description. It's certainly the case that measuring by volume is much more technologically simple. Manufacturing a vessel of relatively uniform size is a lot easier than manufacturing even the most primitive scale. Cheap, mass-produced scales were not widely available until the turn of the 20th century. It's only around then that we start to see recipes written by weight in any country. If you look at recipes from the early 19th century, they'll say things like, put in the amount of flour equivalent in size to, you know, a large egg. You know, like, what, what does that mean? So I wonder if maybe the sudden transition to metric that so many countries went through in the 20th century, maybe that provided them with an opportunity for a reset. When you're throwing out your ancient system of measurement, it's not much harder to go a little bit further and throw out your ancient system of measuring things by volume. And a scale is only one new piece of gear to buy. As opposed to a whole new set of volume measures, a scale is one thing to buy. My little hypothesis is that we in the United States, by resisting metrification, we have denied ourselves the opportunity for that kind of society-wide reset. 
And as a result, we're still cooking with methods that were developed by pioneer ladies who were measuring out the ingredients for their cake with a teacup because that's all the gear they had, and it doesn't even matter because you have died of dysentery. As we've discussed here previously, Americans have been quietly adopting metric for decades now. Maybe not so much in the kitchen, but in science and in industry. And if you want to keep up to date on the latest in business, tech, or finance, consider signing up for Morning Brew, the sponsor of this video. Morning Brew is a totally free newsletter that comes to your email every morning. Instead of aimlessly doom scrolling through Twitter, which is something I used to have a very bad habit of doing, now I get caught up on the day's events far more efficiently. Morning Brew takes five minutes to read through. I used to work in news, and now I try kind of hard to avoid the news for mental health reasons, which is good in some ways, but bad in the sense that I often find myself wondering, why is everyone talking about Jeff Bezos and GameStop? It's nice to have Morning Brew just explain it to me. They write in this very breezy, funny voice that is similar to the voice in my own head, and they make their copy skimmable. Maybe I don't want to know the whole deal with GameStop, I just want to know the bottom line. It's completely free, and subscribing takes 15 seconds. Do us both a favor and sign up with my link in the description. Thank you, Morning Brew. Anyway, professional kitchens, especially bakeries, use weight. And when you switch over to weight, it's only natural to switch over to metric as well, because the ounce is too big for cooking. A single ounce is almost 30 grams, and 10 or 20 grams of flour can make a real difference in a recipe. Ounces don't offer you a fine enough scale. And yeah, fractions and decimals exist, but whole numbers are easier to read, and so American bakers have been switching to metric for many decades now. Metric weights are better for cooking. I wouldn't dispute that. My argument here is not against metric. It has nothing to do with metric. My argument is in favor of measuring stuff in the kitchen with volume, regardless of what units you use. And here's reason number one. Volume is visible. Weight is not. We feel weight with our sense of touch. We cannot see weight. What we see is the volume of space that the item takes up. You might think you know what 200 grams of cheese looks like, but you don't, right? What you have is an association. You know from experience how much space a 200 gram block of cheese generally occupies. And you're doing a volume to weight conversion in your head when you look at it and you think, oh, that looks like about 200 grams of cheese to me. This does not have to be your goal, but my goal in the kitchen is to measure things as little as possible. I think it's a lot quicker and easier and more fun to just eyeball stuff. A little bit of this, a little bit of that. And I think that human beings are just much more naturally suited to judging kitchen type quantities by eye rather than by feel of weight. So if you want to cook by eye, I think it makes more sense to just stay in the world of volume most of the time rather than doing volume to weight conversions in your head. One reason why professional kitchens like to work with weights is that the pros are dealing with huge huge quantities. It's really, really hard to intuitively tell the difference between this and this by eye. Whereas like, it's pretty easy to tell the difference between like this and this by eye. Down here, this is the scale of objects that evolution has calibrated our sensory apparatus to judge. Things in this kind of range, and this is the range that we're normally dealing with in the kitchen, right? Reason number two I like volume, you gotta scoop your stuff out with something. You might as well scoop it out with something that gives you a rough idea of how much you have scooped. I mean, I know people who cook with scales sometimes do this thing where they hold the whole flour container over the bowl and just pour it in, but I think that's a pain. You gotta do it slowly to be careful, and if you're not careful, you can easily start an avalanche and then whoop, I think it's easier to scoop out flour with some kind of cup and to scoop out things like baking powder with some kind of spoon. You might as well do it with a cup or a spoon, which helps you judge how much you have scooped. This leads me to reason number three, measuring by volume minimizes dishes, or at least it can help you minimize dishes. To measure by weight, you often have to get a whole big bowl dirty. You need a bowl on the scale. And that bowl is dishes neutral if you're also mixing the food in that bowl. But say you're mixing your stuff in a stand mixer. You can't just put that on a scale while it's in the machine. Sure, if you need to add something in halfway through your mixing process, you could take it off the machine and then put it back on the scale. But I think it's easier to just leave it in the machine and simply scoop in whatever you need to add and to scoop it with a scooper that helps you keep track of how much you have added. And if you're mixing your stuff in a pot, you can't just take the pot off the heat and put it on your scale. You're gonna melt your scale. What you're gonna do is you're gonna measure your stuff in a bowl 
bowl on the scale, which is going to make that bowl dirty, and bowls take up more space in the dishwasher than a measuring cup or a spoon. Now, to be sure, measuring by volume can definitely create way more dirty dishes. If you get out a different cup or a different spoon for every darn quantity that you're measuring, so you know, don't do that. I try to cook with exactly one cup and one spoon. That's it. If I need half a cup of flour, just fill the cup up halfway. That's easy to do because volume is visible. And if I need a quarter of a teaspoon of yeast, to just fill the spoon up a quarter of the way. Which leads us to reason number four. Volume is actually much more accurate with very small quantities. Like a quarter of a teaspoon of dry yeast is about 0.75 grams. Kitchen scales usually don't show fractions of a gram because they're not accurate with weights so light. Helen Rennie has a terrific video about this topic. It is linked in the description. Normal kitchen scales are accurate enough when you're talking about tens of grams, but just one or two grams? Just try measuring out like three grams of salt. You'll see the scale suddenly jump. You're telling me that last grain of salt weighed a whole two grams? Of course not. For ingredients like flour and cheese, the difference of a gram or two almost never really matters in the kitchen. But for ingredients like salt, or yeast, or like a really strong spice, a difference that small really could matter, and volume is better at accurately measuring those things. But don't take my word for it. Nobody can accuse our friend Kenji of being an imprecise cook. The dude loves precision. And as he explains in this article that is linked in the description, he uses weight to measure big quantities and volume to measure very small quantities. This is one reason why spoons and dashes and pinches persist in recipes, even in places where people are really accustomed to using kitchen scales. Look at this BBC bread recipe. The flour is given in grams, but the salt is given in teaspoons. The only reason they give the yeast in grams is because the yeast comes pre-measured. Seven grams is how much these envelopes hold. Unless you have a scale that is designed to measure fractions of a gram, scales that are often marketed as jeweler's scales, regardless of what substances people actually weigh on them, unless you have one of those, volume is more accurate than weight for very small quantities. Which is not to say that volume is totally accurate either. A teaspoon of salt can be a very different quantity depending on the size and shape of the grains. This is why you can't just go by the recipe. You gotta taste your food. Put in a little salt, taste it. Add more salt if it needs it. This leads me to my fifth and final reason. Measuring by volume encourages you to think for yourself. I'm skating on very thin ice right now. I realize that. I'm speaking purely from my own anecdotal experience, and I'm, I'm theorizing, I'm guessing from my own anecdotal experience, but this is what I will tell you. I know that about half of you, about half of my audience, are here in the United States, where volume is still king in the kitchen. And I also know that most times when I get a DM from somebody who's having trouble with one of my recipes, usually what they're having trouble with is the quantity of flour in one of my recipes. Most of those people in those DMs that I get express their problem to me in grams. And most of their problems have to do with them following my recipe to the letter instead of doing what I said to do, which is to use the recipe or the quantity in the recipe as a baseline, and then add more flour until it feels right. This is pretty much always the advice I offer. Just use the measurement as a starting point, and then keep putting in flour until it looks and feels the way that it's supposed to. And one of the beauties of teaching cooking through a medium like video is I can show you what it looks like. I think, I'm guessing, based upon this experience, that gram recipes might encourage robotic thinking, a kind of paint-by-numbers mentality. This recipe has super precise measurements, so all I gotta do is just follow it to the dot, and I'm gonna have a great dinner. Problem is, it doesn't work that way. For those of us in the cups and spoons world, we're maybe a little more used to measurement alone being inadequate, for flour in particular. A cup of flour is a really different quantity depending on whether the flour is compressed or fluffed up. So because I grew up in the cups and spoons world, maybe I'm just a little bit more used to using the quantities in the recipe as a baseline and then using feel and judgment to take it the rest of the way. If you measure your flour by grams, you're more likely to get away with 
just cooking by measurement and never using your own senses or judgment, but there can still be problems. 50 grams of flour will absorb more or less water depending on what kind of flour it is. It's protein content, whether it's been bleached, how finely it's been milled. When professional kitchens use weight, they're generally working from a recipe that has been written by a chef in-house, right? And that chef knows exactly what kind of flour they're working with. That chef knows exactly how that oven they have there behaves. The test cooks at the BBC don't know about your flour or your oven or how salty you like your bread. We all have to think for ourselves in our kitchens. I'm hypothesizing that if you resign yourself to using a more imprecise measure, like a cup to measure flour, then you're more likely to use your head and your hands instead, instead of just following the recipe like a drone. But I realize that the argument I just made is in conflict with the argument I made for reason number four, right? Sorry about that. If you're in school right now for sociology or psychology or cognition or maybe even like technical communication, I think that you could devise an experiment to test this hypothesis. You give one group of cooks a recipe with really specific quantities to the gram and you give them a scale to cook it with, and then you give the other group uh, a recipe with really kind of vague quantities on it and no scale, but a recipe that gives really specific verbiage about what the thing should look like. And then you just see who has a better experience, whose product comes out closer to the ideal model. Lastly, as I mentioned at the top, there may be a secret sixth reason why I like volume. I was born into volume, right? I was born into the world of cups and spoons. Cups and spoons is who I am. And I like myself. I know myself. I'm comfortable with myself. I don't know other people. I'm not comfortable with them. I fear the unknown. And the world of grams is the unknown. It's not who I am. Maybe that's why I like volume. There's a lot of people in this world who believe that one culture is objectively superior to another culture. And maybe they're right. I don't know. I just know that it's kind of a remarkable coincidence that so many of these people, in fact, I'd say most of these people who believe that there is one objectively superior culture, just happen to have been born into that culture. I mean, what are the odds? How lucky for you. All of us have a very limited understanding of why we like what we like. Luckily, we don't really have to understand it, right? Especially here in the kitchen where the stakes are pretty darn low. Make your dinner however you like it. This is why I like measuring things by volume. Take from that what you will.